Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who has done the thing that we cannot, lived the perfect life, and exchanged his righteousness on the cross with our sinfulness and set us free. Amen. Have you ever been given an impossible task? Or at least one that seemed impossible? Well, maybe you can relate to an example I'll provide. Many of us have attended some form of school class at some point in our lives. Imagine this is what your teacher tells you on the first day of class. If you miss any single point on any assignment throughout the entire semester, you will fail my class. If you are late even by a moment to any one class, you fail. And my class is a class that you must pass in order to move on in your studies. So if you fail, you just have to retake it until you pass. You ready to take that class? Want to sign up? Sign me up. That would be a horrible first day of class. Now, as terrible as that sounds, I suppose you could make the argument that it's technically possible. But it points to something that Luther discovered, that there are things that are asked of us that we cannot do. Things that are, in fact, by our own ability, impossible. Not a very culturally friendly message. In our culture, we like to think that you can do anything that you put your mind to. But the truth is, there are just some things we can't do. For example, in the Bible... Jesus says of every person who would follow him, be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect in Matthew chapter 5. And so we get Martin Luther. Martin Luther understood this truth of the scriptures, this call to fulfill the law, to be perfect. And it led to lots of misery. See, Luther spent most of his life as a Catholic, and as the video showed, right, he was coming home during a nasty storm, and he hides under a tree, and he speaks to God, and he says that if you would spare me from death, I will dedicate my life to you. I'll become a monk. And so he is spared, and so that's what he does, right? He leaves behind a career to pursue as a lawyer, which his dad was very uh, happy that he was doing, to a career that his dad wasn't so happy that he was doing to become a monk. Not very much societal prestige in being a monk. But Luther does that, and what he ends up doing is just about everything that you could possibly do in order to prove that he is worthy of God's love. Spent hours and hours in private confession trying to remember all of his sins of thought, word, and deed. Starved himself as an atonement for the wrong that he had done. Whipped and beat himself all to make atonement for the wrongs that he had done. And to extreme measures, even among his companions, he was excellent in these ways. Very dedicated to becoming worthy and yet... All it led him to was despair. He couldn't help but think that God must be an angry judge. Well, the law of God in God's word presents us with an impossible task. We must keep it. We must be perfect. In order for our righteousness to come through the law, we must keep it totally, unequivocally, perfectly. So you can imagine Luther's distress. Imagine your own distress as if you weren't taught that the freedom of the gospel is in the works of Jesus, but your freedom relies on your perfection. Imagine the anguish. Imagine the misery when you take an honest look at yourself. After all, one of the things we teach that is a use of God's law is that it's a mirror that holds itself up to us and shows us our sin. So Luther is stuck. He's stuck in a system that always brings him misery, that he never can live up to what he's called to do. And he's left only thinking God 
is this angry judge that is impossible to please. And not just about himself, but he comes to be very disillusioned about his fellows in the church, fellow priests and monks and just people in general. And he comes to the conclusion that the scriptures shared with us today, that no one is righteous. No one is righteous. Imagine coming to that conclusion without any real knowledge of the hope of the gospel. No one is righteous, not even me. That's a hopeless situation. And a hopeless situation with the highest stakes possible. Your eternal fate. And then we might be tempted to say, well, is the law bad? Is the law evil? It makes me feel horrible about myself and about the state of things. But Paul answers that question for us. The law of God is not bad. Of course not. It makes us feel bad sometimes because it reveals some unpleasant things about ourselves we'd rather ignore. But it is good. It comes from God. It is, in fact, righteous. One time somebody told me a story, or I read it somewhere, I can't remember, about, like, imagine that at your birth you were given a glass ticket. And this glass ticket is to heaven. But as soon as you have one sinful thought or one sinful deed, that glass ticket shatters into so many pieces, there's no hope of putting it back together again. And according to righteousness from the law, that is our fate. One wrong move, one misstep, and all is lost. Imagine that just even in your human relationships. Imagine if what you said to one another in your marriage vows was, unless you're perfect, I'm out of here. Or imagine parents saying that to their children. The first time you disobey, you're gone. The world would be a terrible place. So is there any hope? Well, our gospel reading provides that. See, the gospel reading talks about the word truth. It says, if you are going to be my disciples, you will abide in my word and you will learn the truth. Now, we get that far and Luther's like, okay, yeah, I mean, it's the truth. I don't like the truth that I'm finding there, but it's the truth. But then it goes on to say, and the truth will set you free. Now, I imagine Luther reading something like that, and it probably makes no sense. How can the truth set me free if it is the truth that is the very thing that is enslaving me, that is keeping me captive, that I am constantly finding I can't live up to, I can't get out of this place that I'm in? See, in that world, the truth only shows you how enslaved to sin you are. And indeed, if righteousness only comes through the law, that is our faith. That is the truth. This impossible task that we can't live up to. But what, is, what happened is interesting to Luther, and what happens to us is very much the same. We continue to abide in God's word, and then you read more and more things like the truth will set you free. And you begin to to think that maybe the truth that you know is not the whole thing. That something is missing, that something is wrong. After all, how could I square a statement like God is love with this angry judge that I'm wrangling with constantly in the law? So Luther continues to read the scriptures. He continues to abide in God's word. And what does it reveal to him but that there is hope? Not hope in ourselves and our ability to do the right thing or to think the right thing, but rather a new hope in something outside of ourselves, in someone outside of ourselves, and he discovers the truth that indeed sets him free. That was our epistle reading for today from Romans 3, reveals this truth. The first half sounds very much like Luther's experience. 
that all those who are born under the law are held to the law, and righteousness through the law is only for those who are perfect. And then the conclusion that is reached there is the same that Luther was eventually led to, that no one is righteous. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone. Nobody is righteous. But Paul continues, he doesn't stop there. He says, now there's a new kind of righteousness being brought into the world. A righteousness apart from this law of God that you and I cannot keep. This law that ruthlessly crushes our reliance on self. Yet Luther thought placed a demand upon the self. But now righteousness is being manifest apart from that law. Righteousness is being manifest In Jesus. Jesus does the work of the law perfectly. When we read in the scriptures some statement of command from God, even from Jesus himself, that we, as soon as he's done saying it, we're just like, there's no way I can do that. The gospel says, I know you don't have any hope in doing that, so I have done it in your stead. Christ has done that in your stead. And just as that knowledge freed Luther from his own anguish, from his self-hatred, from his feeling of hopelessness and helplessness under the law, so too it frees us. Not through the works of my own, but through the perfect works of Jesus given to you as a free gift. You don't even have to do anything to earn the righteousness of Jesus, much less your own. He gives it to you freely. When he goes to the cross, he takes your sin and your unrighteousness, and in in place of that, he gives you his perfect righteousness so that now when God looks at you, he doesn't see an unworthy person dead in their sins who's made themselves an enemy of God but he sees his perfect son. Thanks be to God for that. What glorious freedom there is. Now take a moment to try and imagine what it must have been like for Luther when he really finally, that was revealed to him in the scriptures. Or maybe you've had a similar experience yourself if you have come to the faith as an adult or maybe just came to a new realization of the radical love of God and Jesus that we are hearing in the gospel. That's why it's so important for us to abide in the word of God. That is where that truth, that freedom is revealed. Now I want you to take a moment to imagine putting yourselves in the shoes of someone who doesn't know any of this. Each of us knows many people who are in that category, who don't believe in Christ, who don't know of him, and are enslaved in the same way that Luther was, in the same way that we all once were. Placed in a situation that is hopeless. A situation where we never live up to the task we're called. I don't know about you guys, but we don't even live up often to our own standards, much less God's. Now, we live in a culture where it's easy to distract ourselves from that truth, but at some point in time in each person's life, and often more than once, the reality of the hopelessness of sin makes itself known. And in those moments without Christ, there really is no hope. They're in the same boat as Luther. They're in the same boat as me, in the same boat as you, condemned by our unrighteousness. But thanks be to God for his love in sending Jesus, for he has done what we cannot. And so we are now called to share that message of freedom, that message of the grace and love of God in Jesus with all of those people out there who do not know him, who are enslaved in their sin, so that they too can know this glorious feeling of freedom and no longer engage in self-loathing or anger at the world but hope and joy in God who in Jesus tells us to take heart 
for I have overcome the world. I love the way that, that John 8 ends here in our section for the gospel. It says that the slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son does. And so if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now the reason that that, I find that so amazing and is something worth rejoicing about is that as a declaration from the one person in all of creation who has the authority to make it so. At the end of Matthew, when Jesus is giving the great commission to the church, he precedes that whole section by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And with that authority, with that position, Jesus declares you free. And if that isn't enough for you, in the scriptures, the very same word at the beginning of all things that said, let there be light, and there was light, is the same word that says you are forgiven, that you are free, and so you are. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes our understanding, Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in this joyous knowledge that he has done what you cannot and that he has given it to you freely as a gift of faith so that you now are free indeed. Amen. Please rise. Having heard God's word, we now confess our faith together in him with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen.